Welcome to this talk. I'm happy to present this joint work uh, with co-authors from Google and Talker. And uh, our objective here, I've highlighted the different uh, parts of the title to uh, kind of show the different uh, parts. So we want to look at personalized semantics, which is one of uh, our constraints, soft attributes, uh, which I'm going to uh, talk about in a moment. And our method is using constant activation vectors. So to jump right into what our uh, setting is. So let's say we have this uh, person. She recently handed in her thesis. She's jumping into the job market and she wants to interview for jobs. So now she needs uh, to buy some clothes that are appropriate for this purpose. So she says, I need some business-like clothes. And she goes on to her favorite shopping website and they give her personalized recommendations for clothes uh, based on her history. Um, but a lot of these recommendations aren't actually business-like. So naively, the, the recommender in this case can't access what the user needs at that moment. What we would like is for her to be able to communicate and need something business-like, uh, then for the uh, recommender to show her only business-like items tailored to her interests. And maybe she has another, uh, another requirement, for example, not, not too boring, so she wants something colorful. And then she gets uh, some recommendation based on those two requirements. So that's conversation recommenders. We've been hearing uh, several aspects of those during the session. And in our specific uh, example that I just gave, uh, the problem we have is how is the recommender supposed to know whether something such as t-shirt is business-like? Uh, because business-like is a soft attribute, non-catalog, uh, which a priori there's no information if a given item is or isn't business-like. And there are several approaches to this that jointly learn recommenders and attribute uh, representations. And uh, one of the difficulties of this is that it's hard to extend this to new attributes. So the example I just gave is a uh, fashion shop. So they're going to have lots of new trends. For example, athleisure is a trend that emerged during the past years. Cottage course, another uh, Y2K now doesn't refer to a bug, but refers to a fashion trend that features throwback fashion from the 2000s. Um, so all of these uh, things should be able to also uh, have representations, while we don't want to retrain the whole model. Uh, for example, if I understood correctly, uh, the approach Tina presented for the distribution, distributional contrastive embeddings that focuses on settings where you know the set of keywords in advance. So you can represent your user vectors by a number of keywords length vector. Uh, I hope I understood correctly. Um, so our approach to co-convent this is to use concept activation vectors or CAVs on top of an existing collaborative filtering model. So the general idea uh, behind concept activation vectors is that for useful concepts, we can find a linear representation of this concept, which is the concept activation vector in the embedding space that the collaborative filtering model learned. And these calves can be found, found after training, for example, using logistic regression. And because they are linear models, we require relatively few labels to learn them. Now, uh, advantages of this approach is that firstly, we can focus the capacity of our collaborative filtering model on the actual recommendation task. Uh, as I previously said, uh, this requires few labels or fewer uh, than we're training with a model with higher capacity. Um, CAVs are known from testing with concept activation vector work, which tests whether a model uses a given concept, concept using a CAV. And then our setting, we can use this CAV to identify whether a concept is useful for recommendations, which is for describing preferences. And we can easily extend our approach uh, to new concepts. As soon as we get any labeled data available, we can start training a CAV for that specific concept. So to briefly describe the setting, first of all, we assume we have user item ratings. 
this user previously rated this button down shirt with four stars, for example. And we assume we have some collaborative filtering model that learns a user embedding function phi u and an item embedding function phi i. Now, this collaborative filtering model can be trained uh, using matrix factorization or dual encoder model. Um, we are agnostic to this uh, exact specification. All we need is this user embedding and item embedding function. And now, in addition to user item ratings, what uh, a lot of shops provide is the possibility for some users to also add tags uh, to items. Now, this may not be the same user that uh, is using the shop and previously rated items and may not be the same items that we're looking at. Uh, but in this example, some person rated a shirt with uh, tagged a shirt with business like. Now, what this item embedding function will give us is some kind of representation of items in an embedding space. And as this uh, ordering here suggests, we assume that we can find a separating hyperplane and a direction that represents the business-like concept in this embedding space. So the more we move in this fee business-like direction, the more business-like the items get. And uh, one thing that we briefly explore in our paper as well is that we don't have, actually have to do this in the final embedding layer if we're using a dual encoder model, which uses uh, neural networks to learn phi i and phi u. We can also uh, do this in intermediate layers to get a nonlinear manifold <coughs> output in the embed embedding space. Sorry. <coughs> But for this talk, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to focus on only linear curves in the last layer. The process for training our curves is then as follows. We first extract labels uh, for this concept from tag data. So briefly, we say that we have a positive tag for an item if some user has labeled that item as business-like, for example. And we have a negative tag for that item if some user has previously used the tag business-like, so it's something they do think about, but they've never tagged this specific item of business-like. So that gives us positive and negative tags for each, uh, for a set of items. And uh, then we train calves on the set using binary logistic regression, where the business-likeness of an uh, item is predicted by the dot product of the cost activation vector for business like and the item embedding. Uh, data that we use to evaluate this idea uh, is synthetic data generated using Rexim engine, where we generated ratings and tag data and learned embeddings for those, and also Movie Lens 20 million, uh, where we have user item ratings as well as user item tags. And uh, we filtered these to the 164 most used tags because, frankly, a lot of movie lens tags are um, well, needlessly specific and also preference irrelevant. So there are users who have spent a lot of time tagging uh, movies uh, with like DVD or something, um, which in this case would confound our results. Um, so averaging across the synthetic tags, uh, for the synthetic, synthetic data and the 164 movie lens tags uh, for movie lens, we get a mean curve accuracy uh, as reported in this table, where curve accuracy means whether our concept activation vector can predict based on the embedded representation or the item has been tagged as business like or not. And if business like is the tag we're going for. And we know that there's a lot of hidden structure, at least in the movie lens 20 million data, because of uh, the way people apply tags. So just to confirm that we're not actually learning um, tagging patterns as opposed to concept patterns, we added a preference irrelevant tag parity of the year and uh, replaced a subset of tags with parity of the year based on whether the parity of the year, the movie, uh, came out was zero or one, uh, even or odd. 
And here we, as expected, get about 50% accuracy. So we're not just learning tagging behavior. So what we find is that indeed we can learn directions in embedding space that predict preference relevance user tags. Now, initially, uh, when I read my title slide, I promised that we would also talk about uh, personalized semantics. And one part of that is subjectivity. So in our paper, we identified two types of subjectivity. The first being degree subjectivity. Two users uh, might agree that uh, the two items I'm showing here are more formal than more business-like than other items. But they might still say the item on the left doesn't qualify as business-like to me. Only the item on the right would be appropriate for a job interview. Whereas another user might say, no, they're both business-like, it's perfectly fine, you could wear both. Another type of sub subjectivity is sense subjectivity. Uh, for example, if a user says they like wearing sporty clothes, uh, this could refer to this kind of athleisure or even athletic wear shown on the left, or it could refer to comfortable clothes that people could use to run errands but would never wear to a business interview as shown on the right. So in this case, uh, users disagree about uh, what kind of idea they have in mind when they say the word sporty. Now in the first case, um, where we have degree subjectivity, uh, we can say that users agree on what direction this constant activation vector should take, but they disagree on what threshold should be used to classify business-like versus non-business-like. And we can solve this by instead of treating tag prediction as a classification problem, we can treat it as a regression or a ranking problem per user, where per user we ask uh, our calf to predict whether they think that one item is more business-like than another. And uh, we can train uh, linear, linear regressors that predict this, for example, using RankNet, and uh, we explore several methods in our paper. And uh, when we uh, use synthetic tags generated with degree subjectivity, uh, we do improve uh, our synthetic data prediction performance by quite a bit. And in MovieLens, unfortunately, we don't have uh, ground truth data, but we do explore a bit on what types of concepts appear to be degree subjective in our paper. Now for the sense uh, subjectivity, I've said that a concept means different things to different users. So the way we approach this is by using an expectation maximization like uh, calf learning approach, where we cluster users and then uh, learn optimal calves for each cluster and then reassign users to clusters based on which calf best um, describes the tags they use. And this approach also allows us to improve accuracy for sense subjective tags quite a bit on the synthetic data. And for movie lens data, uh, we evaluate this by grouping uh, several tags to meta tags to create one tag that can be used in different senses. So we created uh, four meta tags that are sense subjective and our results uh, are trained only on those meta tags, but we achieve much better accuracy uh, using our expectation maximization calf approach. So we can find directions in embedding space that represent pre preference relevant concepts, even when those are used subjectively. So we're learning personalized semantics and embedding space. Now you might say, okay, uh, interesting, but the original motivation for this was conversational recommenders. So um, when are we going to hear about how to use this for conversational recommenders? Uh, we explore one possible application of calves in our paper. So assuming we have these item embeddings, we've learned a concept activation vector for business-like. And now we also have uh, the user embedding, which so far we haven't used at all. And now let's say this user says they need something business-like or more business-like then we can adapt our user embedding in calf direction to get a user embedding that's more similar to business-like items than non-business-like items. And to evaluate this, we use a simple critiquing setup where the recommender presents a slate of items. The user requests more or less of some concept G. And we update the user model uh, by adding the scaled version of, a scaled version of the constant activation vector. 
and our experiments show uh, we have uh, that user average utility per slate on movie lens uh, does increase quite a bit <laughs> uh, using these types of critiques. And in the paper, we also use a variety of metrics uh, to measure this and report, and of course, also evaluate on synthetic data. So this is just one application. We are uh, excited in ongoing work to evaluate additional ways uh, how cows can be used. And for now, thank you for your attention. And thank are you. there any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. Any questions, uh, quick questions from the audience? Christina, I actually, I actually have a one question. Um, um, in the movie uh, lens data set, you basically create the uh, matter tags. Um, can you provide, I guess, sort of an example, like what type of uh, matter tags basically sort of uh, created for the movie lens data set? Uh, yes, I can. Let me go back very quickly. Um, I have it in my notes, so just one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, uh, we created a monsters tag where we grouped zombies, ghosts, and vampires. And then basically we replaced all of the tags, all of these three tags by monsters, uh, but maintaining one single sense per user. So for one user, we would, we would replace all zombie tags by monsters, for another all ghost tag by monsters, another all vampires tag by monsters. And then we learned calves on this monsters tag. You got it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other last minute question? I, I, I don't see any more questions. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Christina, for great presentation.